Evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of In Conversation, uh, the Royal Society of Medicine's uh, evening, Wednesday evening chance to interview interesting people. And tonight we have a most interesting person. We're very privileged uh, to have Don Berwick, Professor Don Berwick, a pediatrician, and has been described as the patron saint of patient safety. He and Lucien Leap. Uh, produced some of the seminal papers on that subject. So we will be talking about that. Uh, but um, Don, welcome to uh, In Conversation and thank you for joining us. Don, um, you're broadcasting from uh, Martha's Vineyard, lovely spot, uh, just off the coast of Boston. Um, tell us a little bit uh, about the situation in America with uh, COVID, uh, some people saying second wave, third wave, things are going a bit crazy over there, just like they are here in the UK. So your view on COVID in America? Very tense and uncertain, uh, Roger. I, um, I don't know what's going to happen, nor do my colleagues. Uh, we are in a bit of a lull in parts of the country, the part of the country I'm in, in uh, especially, but uh, things are variable around the country. The, um, there are outbreaks in cities that have opened up their schools and bars and um, there's a lot of variation in the United States and people's adherence to the prudent use of masks and hand washing and social distancing. So uh, it's, it's a variable picture, but I, I'm quite concerned. I think we are uh, starting to see the beginning of a surge. Uh, I think you're a little bit ahead of us in that right now, as I understand. And in some parts of the country, it's been pretty bad. Wisconsin, Florida, Georgia uh, are being hard, pre pretty hard hit already by, uh, by recurrence. So we're, we're, we're still in rough times. We still don't have a national strategy or plan in place. Uh, the leadership from the White House has been um, very deficient. So uh, it's state by state uh, strategies at the moment. Yeah, we'll, we'll come uh, on to talk about the White House and the debate that um, we were, uh, we've seen extracts from uh, over here this morning. But um, I mean, do you think that the, the whole of this COVID uh, issue is being politicized, it seems to me, the, the, there's a definite feeling that from the the right wing uh, politicians that the libertarians they call themselves is that the that the uh, the lockdown and the restrictions are taking away people's uh, freedom and that the whole approach is 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 wrong so how, how would you respond to that uh, to that view it's very unfortunate i mean i'm you know a clinical scientist and i think that we should be our public policy should track this, the facts we have. Now, COVID's challenging because we're learning every day and things we thought were true months ago now turn out not to be and vice versa. But um, unfortunately, this has been politicized and uh, it, it, to the point where you can actually track a relationship between the, the amount of the, the uh, disease and the political stripe of the, of the area. So that, for example, very conservative states and, and cities have opened up faster than non than, than, than more cautious ones and uh, they're they're seeing more disease it's been politicized in another way be, uh, because of the racial profiles uh, african americans are uh, dying of covid at two or three or in some places four times the rate of whites the same for latinos and north and uh, native americans especially so it's all wrapped up also with the surge of concern in america about structural racism, the murder of George Floyd. And then of course, everything's textured because of we have an election approaching November 3rd. So it's, it's gotten pretty politicized. There's also um, got a lot of controversy about political interference with the Centers for Disease Control and other scientific bodies in the country in which it has turned out that some of what's been, what's appeared apparently has been written not by scientists, but by, by, uh, pe by, politi by political representatives and that's got everyone very very concerned yeah well uh, i have to say anthony fauci has, has uh, achieved her hero status here in the uk i mean all his pronouncements seem to be uh, uh, absolutely right and uh, we think he's a rather wonderful person do you know him personally at all i've met him but uh, not not really personally but I, I i share your view he's been heroic uh, it's a very tense time this nexus between science and policy he has tried his best. He's remained uh, uh, an important figure in the shaping of national policy, but adhering very strongly to his own nature as a scientist and a believer in, in the importance of research. As that has become politicized, the pressure on him, I'm sure, has increased, but he's been 
very gracious, very high road, and uh, and has and has continued to speak out. We're very very lucky to have him, not just in the U.S. but in the world, as you said. Well, yeah, you're a long-term Democrat. In fact, we'll, we'll come back to talk about uh, you running for the uh, governor of Massachusetts uh, uh, and, and getting, I think, 80%, 18% of the vote. But, um, I mean, would you like to speculate who's going to win um, the uh, presidential election? Uh, I don't know. I, I think, um, I, I, don't, I don't know. We, 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 uh, I, I will not mince my words. We need a change in our leadership. Uh, it's been a disaster. And... Uh, but you know this um, rather uh, the, 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 what what Trump has brought forward is reflecting concerns of people in society about feeling excluded and quite angry and put at disadvantage and they're acting it out in support of a person that has no is, doesn't have the capability in my view to be uh, an adequate president. What's going to happen? I don't know. And of course now we have another layer of concern because because of the pandemic, a lot of the voting is going to be by mail. It always has been somewhat by mail, but now it's going to be a substantial uh, mail vote. There's some evidence that uh, Democrats will be more likely to use the mail route than in-person voting. And um, the president has shown some, uh, he's, he's used some rhetoric to imply that he, he may try in some way to invalidate or to oppose the count, proper counting of the mail of the mail-in ballots. That would be a disaster. It would threaten the, the democratic structure of our country. And it would be, uh, it, it could it could have some pretty severe consequences downstream. Mm -hmm. I think it's very likely. I hope that uh, Vice President Biden does have the majority of votes. But as you know, uh, Trump didn't have majority of votes. He 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 was three million behind Hillary Clinton. But the way our electoral system works, it's possible for someone who doesn't have the it's somewhat for someone to have the minority of votes and still be be installed as president. And that's what happened with President Trump. Yeah. Well, if I were able to vote, I would definitely be voting for uh, Joe Biden. But um, being English, I'm <laughs> not in time to do that. Don, let's go, let's go backwards in time um, and, and uh, tell, tell us a little bit about your upbringing, because uh, I know that your father was uh, more or less a single handed doctor. And actually, you're the second person we've had on in conversation. We had Lord Lamont, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, uh, with John Major. And his dad was the only doctor on the island of Orkney and was a kind of hero figure. Um, oh. Lord Lamont's a bit older than you. He's in his 80s now. But um, in that era, the single-handed doctor who looked after the patients and their families... Uh, it, it, it was extraordinary time. Just, just tell us a little bit about your memories of childhood and, and upbringing. Yeah. Kind to ask, uh, Roger. I grew up in a, a very, very small town, a population of 5,000 in a rural area of Connecticut, a rural state in, the, in our uh, in Northeast in New England. Um, and my father was a GP. Uh, he, he pretty much like uh, a, a, a GP would be in, in, the, in the UK. Uh, for many of my years of childhood, he was the only doctor in town then another one appeared and he did it he did everything he, he had fluoroscopy in his office i remember he he um, he assisted at uh, surgery uh, in the hospital uh, in, in the united states as i think you know uh, uh the a, a doctor like him in a community would also have patients hospitalized uh, we don't we didn't divide in those days hospital care from outpatient care so every morning he would leave, drive 17 miles to the local hospital, do surgery, deliver babies, round on his patients, come back to his office. He had um, he had daytime office hours, evening office hours. He made house calls. It was a one-man show. Sing Single-handed GP would be the, the way you'd say it. And uh, kind of heroic in the town. I mean, nobody would ever mess with him. And uh, I, I once gave a speech at the uh, uh, Royal College of General Practice, where I was honored with a fellowship, just saying that the um, the constable would never give my father a ticket, even though he didn't. He he was a mad driver. He would he would <laughs> drive insane speeds, but you you just wouldn't give the doctor a ticket in that town. It's quite quite an upbringing. I bet Christmas uh, there would be gifts um, uh, to, from the patients to the house and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, was a, it was a rural town and uh, he, he was paid sometimes in chickens or eggs instead of uh, money. And it was uh, exactly, you've got it exactly right. A lot of kids in that town are named for him, as I, I hasten to say, for the right reason. It's because oh. he delivered them. Yeah, I, and that must have influenced you to have a sort of heroic 
father like that because you, you wanted to be a, a medic right from a very early age. Is that right? Or? I, I never remember wanting to be anything else. Mm. I, I dabbled with architecture and astronomy and physics a little, but, I, but I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I always knew I'd be a doctor and I, I, I made the right to choice. So I was headed there from the start. Right. And then um, I was, I was uh, again, reading a bit about you. You met your wife, Anne, at the age of 17. Uh, and you, she was like a, working in the same lab as you or something. Is that right? You had a good memory, Roger. We, we, uh, we um, were both students at Harvard University at that time. The, the women went to Radcliffe College, the, the sister university. So she was a Radcliffe uh, 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 student and I was a Harvard student. Our very first week of school, we were both 17 years old. I might have just turned 18. And uh, I, in a biology lab, she, uh, I, uh, in my course, I, uh, she... Uh, mm -hmm says she moved her seat to sit next to me which is a very flattering image uh, but we met uh, we met the first week of college and 11 years later we married right oh. and you've got four children now two two girls who are doctors right or one girl is a one girl i've got four children two boys and then two girls uh everyone lives in boston the same city we live in and it's or the area and it's very lucky seven grandchildren and one of my children uh, my third child my oldest daughter is a hospitalist she's a doctor Right. And you're a pediatrician. I know you were going to come on and talk about all the other, other amazing thing you did, but you're, is it behavioral pediatrics you specialize in? Is that right? I actually started out as in, in internal medicine, switched to pediatrics, uh, but I trained as a general pediatrician here. Uh, I was hospital based at Boston Children's Hospital. And so my, my practice was, um, you know, sort of uh, general pediatrics with a little emphasis on complexity. But when you're a pediatrician, you're a behavior in behavioral medicine, no matter what you're doing, it's always, there's always a behavioral component. I practice most of my time as an outpatient uh, pediatrician at uh, one of the first health maintenance organizations in America, the Harvard Community Health Plan. Uh, cool. And that's, that's where I did my, I think, 19 years of clinical work. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about patient safety because we, uh, here at the RSM we have uh, a section of patient safety and uh, we have uh, excellent uh, trustees, Natasha Robinson and uh, Libby Haxby have done amazing work in putting together programs, but um, I think you and, and Lucien Leap were the sort of forefathers of it all. So d just tell us a little bit about that and those papers that appeared in JAMA uh, to err is human, and I think there were some predecessors too in the New England Journal of Medicine. So, uh, how did that come about? The, the, your interest in that, because it it has had an enormous impact around the world. It has, uh, yeah. I mean, I have to defer to Lucian. He was, he's the pioneer. Uh, but what happened? It was more like a meeting of streams uh, in in the mid nineteen eighties. Uh, I was uh, practicing pediatrics, but I also was a a clinical professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and in the School of Public Health, and I was very interested in systems, uh, organizations, and became and um, I had had the opportunity when I trained in medicine simultaneously to take a degree in public policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. So I I was joint degree public policy and medicine. The public policy degree was focused on. Uh, tools and techniques for understanding how systems work, political science, economics, operations, research, statistics, and so on. And it, it changed the way I viewed medicine right from the beginning of my career. And as a young doctor, I became concerned about quality of care. Uh, I noticed uh, a lot of things going wrong, not just safety, but the overall, you know, our work didn't match our goals, I guess would be the way I'd say it. And I, I was trying my hardest, but things didn't go right all the time. In fact, there were frequently problems. I became vice president of the organization that I was practicing in, and they asked me to begin systematic studies of quality of care. And the more I looked, the more concerned I got. I felt healthcare, it was, re, it was sort of never designed or it was accreted by accident. Very good people trying really hard to do the right thing. I have enormous respect for the clinical forces, but they get trapped in defects. And so I became a student of quality, but in other industries, uh, in the mid 1980s, I began studying uh, how other, how, like, how did we get to the moon? How did NASA get to the moon? It's really hard to do that. Uh, very hazardous, and we did it. Um, and uh, so I went and studied NASA and talked to people there, uh, manufacturing companies, that, you know, 
products get better, uh, computers get better, cars get better over time. Healthcare was rather stable. We don't we we, we were getting better in in the bio, biomedical technologies, but not in delivery of care. And so that that was the beginning of my career in quality of care. And so between, and I started the Institute for Healthcare Improvement with colleagues to try to do that work as a nonprofit. At that point, quality was a more expansive idea than safety. It included a lot of dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, the National Academy of Medicine codified six dimensions, safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. That was my contribution to the thinking. So quality is multidimensional. One of the dimensions is safety. And at that point, I met Lucian, or we knew each other, but he had worked at the Rand Corporation as a research uh, researcher, as a, as a, uh, a senior phys a scientist, a senior a surgeon on um, quality of care. And he had focused in on this issue of safety. So Lucian and I became very interested in this and, and uh, we, we reached out to together, we formed a sort of journal club, I guess, and um, reached out to other industries, aviation, a nuclear power uh, and others. And, and Lucian began to have the insight about um, safety as a system property. And he had become a co-author of a, the, the most famous study in that field, which was the Harvard Medical Practice Study, which found uh, this very disturbingly high rates of errors and injuries to patients in care. Three and a half percent of patients were being seriously injured in care. That led him to write the, what became the seminal article in JAMA in probably, I would guess it would be the early 1990s on safety as a system property. And that converged with my interest on quality overall as a system property. And one of the probably boring points I try to make is that safety is a, is a, is a quality within the broader frame of all of the qualities we seek in our care. And we've never stopped being colleagues since then. It's been a, a delight to work with him. I should tell your viewers, Lucian is just finishing the manuscript of a book that's the history of safety and healthcare, the, the, the discipline, and he's the person to have written it and it should appear next next year. Oh, great. You don't know, don't know the title of it yet? You probably, probably hasn't. I don't listened. know. It probably hasn't titled yet, but I've read it and uh, I wrote the, I will write the forward for it and it's, uh, it's going to be a big we, contribution. Maybe um, we should get him on uh, to do an in conversation for us sometime next year to coincide with the launch of that book. I would uh, certainly encourage that. Yeah, terrific. So the, uh, then uh, we're interested in, in how um, your ideas, the t your two ideas, the, the ideas of the two of you, I should say, uh, came across the Atlantic because we had a, a uh, chief medical officer by the name of Liam Donaldson. I knew him quite well. Actually, he, he studied urology himself uh, in the early I did not. But he decided he, he couldn't do surgery. He was going to be too dangerous as a surgeon. So he <laughs> became the chief medical officer instead. Probably a good choice, I should think. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember an article he, he did, uh, I think it was in The Lancet, maybe BMJ, um, called An Organization with a Memory. And I think that was a little bit after your pieces in JAMA, if I'm right. To, to, Tell us a little bit about that, because I, I know you've been very influential in the development of this specialty in, in the UK. Well, Liam's a good friend and a great hero of mine. Uh, it's more than, more than you want to know, but basically in, in 1996 or 97, I, I began working with the British National Health Service uh, at the request of, uh, of Alan Langlands, now Sir Alan Langlands, who, who was the head of the NHS. Alan had become interested in quality himself, and he knew that I had been working on uh, quality assessment and improvement, and so he asked me to meet with a top table at the NHS. Um, and uh, so I got pretty deeply involved with the National Health Service about then, and it never stopped. Um, when Tony Blair got elected, uh, I became part of the what, what he called the Modernization Board, which was his attempt to actually he was focused mostly on waiting times in in the British National Health Service, and that which matched my competence. That so I intersected with Liam then, and we began we became uh, friends and colleagues. Yes, he he tracked the work. Uh, the The actual report was not a JAMA article; it was a National Academy of Medicine report uh, okay. called "Two Errors Human." That was a big report. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if Liam had already started on it, but but he was underway within a short time to produce a, a, another big report in England then called An Organization with a Memory, which was essentially the same set of ideas. Safety is an issue. It We can do something about it, but not by beating up on people. It, we have to treat it as a design problem and, and design systems for safety. And he wrote that quite eloquently and became a, a, an international champion for that 
that point of view. And we've, we've, uh, I've had the privilege of working with him ever since. He also became, as you probably know, a, a leader of the effort in the World Health Organization to generalize the safety movement to a global scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. Well, on, on this um, program, we had a doctor called David Sellu who uh, came a cropper as a result of uh, uh, a kind of systems error that led to a patient dying uh, uh, from a perforated diverticular disease. And he got prosecuted by the Cri uh, Crown Prosecution Service and actually ended up in prison. And he, I mean, he, he's a sort of exemplar of the, 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 the blame approach on one clinician when the, actually there were all sorts of circumstances that led him into the trap of maybe, sure he made some mistakes, but, but uh, I mean, it, it, do, do doctors ever go to prison in, in America for mistakes they make? I don't know about prison, but certainly we this blame and shame approach, uh, the idea that somehow if we just yell loud enough or scare people enough, care will be safe. It, it's here as it is in, in the UK. I do, I'm aware of nurses that have almost gone to prison uh, because they've been involved in an error. And it's mm -hmm. such a terrible misunderstanding of the nature of, of safety. I mean, when you have a shipment, yes, I mean, that's a criminal and you have to sh shut it down. But most of the ways people get hurt is that uh, things go wrong in the process of care in the hands of very good and well-intended clinicians who are trapped in systems that can't be safe. And uh, it, it's been very, very hard in both our countries to wean ourselves from blame and think, finger pointing and accusation and hunting for the culprit as the way to get to safety. It will never work. It can't work. And uh, the science that Lucian leap uh, had discovered that I had just worked with and that, that we you know we both try to purvey uh, through uh, through our research and our teaching is that no th th you know when we treat a patient with a migraine headache or breast cancer we try to look at the science to say what would help and this and we have to think the same way scientifically about what we understand about the sciences of quality overall and in in the in, in, and in safety also the good news is safety sciences and quality sciences are pretty well developed. There's, there's a lot known, probably now already a good solid 70 or 80 years of research in many industries on, on quality, how to, how to make things go right every time with a normal workforce, not heroes. Uh, and safety is probably the most advanced of such research, but getting that stuff into, into leadership and thinking and policy, is that's, that's the task and it's been very difficult. Yeah, we, we have an organization um, called uh, Doctors Association and, and Learn Not Blame, I think, is their, uh, is their maxim. Uh, but I'm afraid, uh, you know, the blame culture is, is still there. Uh, do you think that a health system like the UK, the British system, the uh, national health system, it would be, should be theoretically an easier system to yes. use kind of across the board policies? Because, you know, it seems to me, although you've got, the, I know that you've got the best hospitals in the world in America, because I've trained in, in Hopkins and uh, in uh, Sloan Kettering and uh, Baylor and so on. And they're fantastic hospitals with fantastic teams working there, so dedicated, so amazing. But you, you, you've got disparities in, in, in some hospitals, I guess, are veterans hospitals, perhaps, are not, are not as good as they should be. So... I know you've been an advocate of, of uh, the UK system in America, not always a popular uh, thing to advocate, especially amongst Republicans, probably. So what are your views about health systems, you know, in general, not just America and the UK, but worldwide? Yeah, I've been an advocate of, uh, of national health insurance on the payment side. Uh, right. And I think that that gives you a lot of opportunity for what you said, Roger, of kind of coherent policies, investments, foresightedness. Uh, you can move resources around, and and you can also redistribute efforts where the where the where things are needed. When you're trapped in a fee for service system, a fragmented system like we have in the in the U U.S., it's it's a bit harder to do that. Um, uh, you know, in your country and mine, the average m most performance is average. I mean, that's the definition of average. And so, the fact that you can sometimes find an exceptional outlier or hero it may teach you something, but that's not the way to get to excellence for everyone. You have to build 
healthcare delivery so that it's it just works right all the time. And I think that is possible to do in your country and my country. What what I what I admire about the the National Health Service is that it's possible to set a specific uh, agenda, as as say Tony Blair did on waiting times. Now I know there was some controversy, but when Blair came in and I first got involved with the modernization effort, your waiting times were really bad. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination, people were waiting in general practice. You, you had you were rated very low in, your, in the OECD nations in your cardiovascular outcomes and your cancer care. And your prime minister was concerned. Why he was concerned, I don't know. I assume because he wanted, he, he's, he, he was concerned as a person, but also probably wanted to get reelected. But what, what Blair, what he did was said, okay, we're going to fix it. And there were meetings at number 10, and there was a structure set up to actually address waiting times. And it was controversial. You never make friends with everyone, but you could see the kind of systematic deployed effort uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the health service. And it worked. You have, you know, there, there's very strongly documented, very carefully documented improvements in, in waiting times in the sort of 1999 to 2006 period in the NHS. It worked in your cancer care, your results got much better. It worked in your cardiovascular care, your results got much better. That's, that's take that as read, it happened. And it happened because the, your government decided to invest in it. Here in a fragmented system in the US, it's really hard to set agendas like that and execute them. You can at local level perhaps, or even sometimes at state level, but uh, there's, there's, it's, a, it's a more, um, much more diverse and difficult to get your hands on in, in that system. And we, we have trouble setting agendas. And I, I know you're interested in the concept of clinical leadership. And there's a question here from uh, Samantha Harding. She says, does the NHS have too many managers and should clinicians be managers rather than non-clinicians? What, what are your thoughts about that question? I don't personally buy into the either or uh, view of lay versus clinical management. I've seen, I met wonderful uh, lay managers who have all the spirit and all the intelligence it takes to make good things happen. And you have many examples in, uh, in, in your country. Uh, I, I've uh, watched uh, Sir David Dal Dalton and his work at uh, Salford Royal. I, th I don't think David's a clinician, uh, but uh, it's a beautiful system. It's run very, very well. So there are good examples on both sides. I do believe, uh, as, as was Samantha's question, I think clinicians should be involved in management to be there, please. You know a lot about patients, you know a lot about care, and I think building that bridge is very important. I think tribalism is not helpful. I think you know there are lay people that can do a terrific job in leadership and clinicians also. So I, I tear down the wall instead of building one. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your uh, appointment by um, President Obama. Um, to run the health, basically the, the funding for healthcare services, Medicaid and so on. Because that, that, that ended up with great controversy, but you were there for 18 months or so. Uh, there's a bit of a yeah. story behind that, Don. Yeah, um, it was totally a surprise to me. My career, is, as we've talked about, has been on trying to help healthcare improve globally and running a, a, a nonprofit organization with a global mission, but rather small organization. But I, when Obama, when President Obama was elected, uh, I was asked to, he asked me to come to Washington to uh, take over the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. In the United States, we have a very complex payment uh, uh, insurance environment. Uh, about 150 million people get their insurance through their employer, but about 110 million Americans get their insurance from government. Uh, half of them are elders who have, they, they have national health insurance over age 65, that's Medicare. And people who are very poor or have other stresses get uh, healthcare insurance from a state federal partnership called Medi Medicaid. So the, what, I, what I was asked to take over is that federal structure for Medicare and Medicaid, massive structure, uh, $820 billion a year when I took it over, uh, 100, uh, 110 million people covered. Um, and I, you know, I, I was very flattered and, and honored to, to do that. I took it on. My agenda was exactly what we're talking about, which was quality improvement. I just thought we, we can, here's a chance to really change the, the fate of uh, and the, the, the um, security of a lot of people who are sick and vulnerable. This was also in the highly political context of the, of the Affordable Care Act. President Obama chose to make his flagship policy move, trying to get people, more people into coverage in America. 
uh, we have, uh, at the time he took over, we had about 30 million people, uh, 50 million people without coverage. Um, uh, we, and, and today we have 30 million people without coverage. It's an embarrassment. They have no insurance. Uh, Obama decided to try to use an expansion of federal participation in insurance, the Affordable Care Act, to make that happen by offering insurance through a number of structures from the federal government. And I was also responsible for the early implementation of that. It was highly politicized and the Republicans strongly opposed the Affordable Care Act, they still do. Uh, and so I was in the, in the targets, you know, in the crosshairs of the target here being the person supposed to implement it. In, in, in that position required uh, Senate confirmation and the Senate was controlled by, by the Republicans enough that they could oppose my confirmation. So yes, I stayed for uh, 17 months because the president has the right to put someone in a job that long without confirmation, but I was the administrator. It was very, very interesting episode. And I, I it's, what, what a privilege. I mean, we helped cover 20 million, 22 million more people in my country. We did massive projects on quality improvement. We, we moved a lot toward uh, home and community-based services, not just in hospital services, uh, there were uh, expansions of our safety net. It was a, it was just a thrill, but very very tense politically and um, um, a, a real education. But uh, still, I regard it as uh, probably the luckiest yeah. time. I know you life. got kicked back from the Republican politicians, but did did you get any kickback from the positions? Because my my some of my American colleagues I know are very protective of their doctors' rights. You know, they think the doctors uh, they don't like their their uh, clinical views to be uh, 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 impacted uh, by either payors or by managers. They're very independent. What, it, what Did you get any negative fatigue from the profession? At the personal level, I got support. I, I, was, I was supported and endorsed by every professional group and every uh, hospital group. Uh, they, you know, my, my work on quality was well known, so it wasn't a problem personally. But however, there are elements that are hard for physicians to begin to uh, adapt to. For example, um, quality metrics. Uh, it, it's a bit of a hassle for doctors because there's a lot of things being measured, probably too many things now. And we were part of that implementation of trying to more daylight on quality. And, and, uh, and there, was, there was concern about that uh, from the professions. I'm, I must say, and the other thing was cost. We, we have outrageous costs in American healthcare. We're so much more expensive than any other nation on earth by almost by 50%, by double. Uh, and it's, it's terribly difficult for the private sector, for workers, for patients, and for, for government, which has other uses for money. And part of the agenda is to try to find a way to re reduce the cost, get the waste out of the system. So the costs fall. And that's difficult because one person's cost is another person's income. And so, and the Affordable Care Act had a number of mechanisms around uh, setting rates of payment, uh, incentive programs in which both the hospitals and the physicians, uh, they, they, yes, they pushed back. Um, it, my job, it seemed to me, was to try to find a way to bridge that so that we could work on better care, work on quality as the mechanism for cost reduction. That still remains my belief that for any country, yours and mine that, that are concerned about healthcare costs, the, the, route to, the route to cost reduction is excellence in care. Uh, I, I firmly believe that and that's the agenda we followed. Overall, I must say I was, uh, I, I was pleased by the reaction of the clinical forces I got to deal with and, and, and the people that give care. They really want to do the right thing and, the, and government can help. Yeah, I'm just gonna read out a couple of things. We had a couple of comments from, I think you might know uh, these people, Donal Collins is GP. Says, oh yes, yes, yes. You know, to improve right. safety, we need organizations to think and act selflessly. This seems impossible when everybody focuses mainly on balancing the books, I think in the UK, but not on outcomes, which in turn, ironically, would balance the books. Um, he said he'd had some conversations with you uh, earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Donal was part of uh, the agenda of the um of the uh, uh, vanguards, the new care models that I got involved in in the latter parts of my engagement before I went to CMS. Uh, I mean, so, no, uh, no, after that, when I got out of CMS, uh, Simon Stevens asked me to help with the, the, the redesigns. And Don, uh, I remember Donald's passion for commitment to patients, and he's absolutely right. The, the, um, 
the, the uh, conviction, which I strongly hold, that the best route to the right budget is to do the, give the, the right care uh, uh, is hard. It's a hard sell. It's so much easier to work on budget cutting than quality. No, this uh, must be another buddy of yours, Mitch Blair. Uh, he says, great interview, Don. So good to hear about your early life influences. What do you like to do when you're not working? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as our interview is over, I'm going to be on my bicycle, uh, <laughs> riding around. My, I love bicycling. Uh, I, um, I love wine. And I actually, the R RSM has been doing some wine seminars that I've been uh, part of. Uh, and, uh, and then with seven grandchildren, I suppose that's my main <laughs> avocation. There's a lot of, a lot of attention to give these wonderful little kids from two years old to 11 years old. So that's my uh, pleasure. That's a perfect segue, as you, as you like to say in America, or, uh, because tomorrow night we have uh, Jane McQuitty, who is the wine correspondent of the Times newspaper here in London. And she's doing a wine tasting seminar where she's going to tell us a little bit about some wines that she's selected along with David. So uh, that's, that's a good plug for her. But um, I, I, Don, I think you were involved in the setting up of NICE in the UK. Um, I think, and actually it's an RSM, ex-RSM president, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Rawlins. Mike Rawlins, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great guy, good character. So and he was the first um, chairman of, of, of NICE. So, I mean, you, you we got kicked back from doctors about nice because they said, oh, you know, rationing and uh, interference, interference with cl my clinical judgment. Um, but now I don't hear much criticism about nice. And I think it's been pretty amazing. Uh, in, fact, in fact, the current uh, CEO of it uh, is Gillian Leng, who was a trustee with us, a really lovely person uh, and a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, clinician. So tell us a little bit about nice and, because they seem to haul you across the Atlantic to advise about these things, Don, and then uh, uh, yeah. then you fly back to Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> uh, I, I miss the chance to visit. I, uh, my, my, my favorite trips are to the UK. Um, uh, well, you're being too kind. Mike Rollin is the, the, you know, the real architect, I think, and I think his contributions will, are of historic dimension. I think a century from now, what he did with NICE will be looked back on as a as an amazing uh, convergence of policy and science. Um, I, I, my, NICE is extremely controversial in the US. One way to, to really get criticized is to speak highly of NICE because one aspect of NICE, which is its alleged relationship to rationing is anathema in the US. We, 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 uh, rationing is a dirty word. Uh, and I think the part of NICE that worked on uh, cost effectiveness assessments and the thresholds for uh, quality adjusted life years, that's highly controversial. And I think, um, you know, any, every country has to make its decisions as to how to decide to where to put its resources. And, and NICE, uh, NICE has been a creative uh, example of that. What, 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 is, what is really remarkable about NICE to me has been its approach to uh, making, to melding science scientific back scientific facts and and research together with guidelines for for clinical behavior the the way that nice assembles knowledge about the best science and puts it makes it accessible and at the same time gets the voices of patients and families and the community in i think is is world leading and it's been a it's been an extraordinary enterprise i must say i've lost touch with it since um uh, since Mike left, uh, through no intention of mine, but it's uh, it, it was quite a breakthrough. Mike, I, I think Mike it was at the Reith lectures. I can't remember Mike's uh, major address, uh, uh, capstone lecture. That is, it's 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 archivally important. If anyone wants to understand what evidence-based care should mean, should read that lecture. Next time you're over in in London, we'll have to introduce you to the current uh, C, uh, CMO of. Um, uh, no, uh, CEO of NICE, mm -hmm. Julian Lang. So we've, we're, I think we're proud of NICE here in, in the UK. And we're definitely, everybody loves the NHS. It's, uh, it's got iconic status uh, uh, over here amongst the general public. But, you know, we're not so uh, proud of North Staffs. It still has uh, uh, bad implications. And you were involved in writing uh, the, the Berwick report on, on North Staff. So... In a nutshell, tell us your views about what went wrong there. 
Yeah, um, it's hard to do it in a nutshell, but uh, so it, you had metrics. Uh, Sir Brian Jarman has long ago produced a, a case mix adjusted approach to measuring mor mortality and, and regularly uh, his work was used publicly to, um, to, note, to note mortality rates around the country. Uh, Brian's position has been that one of the unequivocal outcomes that we can measure without any any hesitation is death. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened was the system that was erected around Brian's work and Puro College's work rang a bell. They rang an alarm uh, about death rates at, 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 at um, mid-staffature. Uh, now, when that happens, when a bell goes off, uh, one of two things can happen. People can say, oh my goodness, we have an issue. Let's go, let's go fix it. Some, something went wrong. Or the other possibility is people get really scared and they hide. And that totally depends on context. It depends on how leaders are behaving. It depends on the, the ambient structures. Fear and safety, fear and improvement are completely incompatible. Fear is, was mid-staff's response. And uh, what happened was they hid. Uh, the the uh, mortality rate was not the only signal. There was plenty of information available coming from patients and families and some staff. But when people get frightened, all sorts of negative cycles begin. In the case of mid-staffs, they, instead of addressing the data, they attack the data and actually change their coding processes so that they, they just kept trying to, to hide it. I don't know exactly why that happened there, but it happened. And, the, and fear breeds fear. Uh, Robert Francis, when he did his report, uh, found that. He found, well, look, you all knew this was going wrong. How could you possibly have let this happen? And so he wrote a very hard-hitting report with 290 or so recommendations. Um, when David Cameron got that report, it was overwhelming. 290 things to do and press on this and everyone angry and, 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 and fear abound and abundant. And so what he asked me to do uh, through intermediaries was to pull together a group and take a breath and say, okay, what can we actually act on here? And uh, the report we wrote, uh, a promise to learn, a commitment to act, uh, was an extraordinary uh, part of my life because we had this committee, I think of 15 or so or 18 people, three of them were patients or families that had been injured. And we worked it through. We took the science, we went back to the facts and, and realized that um, the, the source of the problem in staffs was uh, defective processes, but fear and hiding, and that, that's not okay. And so we, 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 we wrote a report which addressed uh, conversion, a, a shift of emphasis from blame and anger and finger pointing leading to fear to an, a culture of learning. And that, that, that's the key transition. It's to create organizations of, of people, most of whom are good, and say to them, it's okay to learn. It's okay to look at the facts, address, uh, name the issues, acknowledge the problem, apologize uh, for what's wrong, and then go about the job of redesign as, as, as a community of effort to learn, learn to do better. And that's the transition that was needed. When, when learning goes away, improvement goes away. And that's what happened amid staffs. Well, David Whitaker has just uh, sent in a question. He says, congratulations on the Berwick report. Uh, please, what are your current thoughts about the importance of nurse staffing ratios? And do you think increasing healthcare staffing is a top global issue for patient safety? That's a good question. It is a good question. It's a controversial one. And I, I do have a position on it, which uh, I, I, I take without arrogance. I, I could be wrong, but... Um, uh, certainly there are staffing levels which are, which are dangerously low and there should, there need to be threshold ideas about just, you know, when it becomes totally inadequate. For most of us in developed countries, I don't think it's a ratio. I don't think it'd be addressed as a ratio matter for, for two or three reasons. One reason is the ratio needed is highly local. It's contextual. It has to do with what exactly is going on there and who knows who and, and, and what the, the architecture is like. And I, I don't think mandated ratios across the board are particularly wise way to allocate resources. Uh, what's needed is local sensing mechanisms so that every, every clinical leader, every manager, and every hospital knows the level of stress right now and has the capacity to 
relieve stress through all sorts of mechanisms, including adding staff when needed. So I would, I, I think there need to be mechanisms for sensing stress and responding rather than, than fixed ratios. The second is we're, we're in an evolving industry all the time. We should be, we should be asking questions all the time about how we do things. And, and if we, as we move, let's say toward tele, telemedicine and remote monitoring, as we use different technologies, different machines, of course, the, the roles of staff change. And so to fossilize, to, to, to encase um, a particular ratio at a particular time, it's a concession to a status quo that we, shouldn't, we should always be, be questioning. So that leads me to a very difficult position I've taken, which is I don't think fixed or legislative staffing ratios are a particularly good idea. I think we need to sense what's happening and insist that people be responsive when staff are under stress. That sounds good. Well, Hugh Wilkins is, uh, I'm going to read this out because I think this is a, a good point too. One of the learning points in your 1996 BMJ publication, a primer on leading the improvement of systems is, inverted commas, this is you saying it, concentrate on meeting the needs of patients rather than the needs of organizations. Uh, unfortunately, tendencies of NHS organizations and their representatives can sometimes be short term and they worry about their reputational management rather than the needs of patients. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that he's asking? Yeah, two thoughts. One is um, exactly right. If you, the whole field of quality, my field, uh, I, if I had to encapsulate it is, is, you know, in a sentence, it's, it's meet every individual's needs on their own terms. It's, 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 it's every person's, every patient's the only patient. Every person's the only person. And, and the system we're after is one which continually asks patients and families, every single person, what, what matters to you? What do you, what, what, what do you need now? And then to build a system that can absolutely focus on every individual. That is the nature of quality. And believe it or not, and most people wouldn't believe it, that when you design a system that way, that we're doing exactly what matters to the person we're trying to help in their terms, you get the most efficient system. It's the lowest cost system. I truly believe that. But organizations tend to do the opposite. They tend to homogenize, make rules, and kind of uh, lose that track uh, uh, of the individual. Now, uh, it, that's a leadership issue, because if the leaders are signaling that we are here for every single person, every single moment, on their terms, uh, that, that signal goes down into the organization and people feel empowered to do that. And you can see organizations that do that. I see that uh, the East London Foundation Trust, which is one of my iconic organizations. I know it's people talk about a lot in the UK for a good reason, because there it's this, this way that they have a way to identify needs and, and involve patients and families in their care. That's what I'm talking about. Um, when you do the opposite, things go, there's a vicious cycle has begun and then people end up focusing up instead of focusing down. They're trying to keep the management happy and the management's trying to keep the press happy and the press and the management are trying to keep the politicians happy. And that's that your eyes are in the wrong direction. Everyone's eyes need to be on the, the hierarchy is where the patient is the boss. The patient is the focus. It's very hard to do that. And, and you can tell when you walk in an organization, which, which direction are people looking up to the C-suite or down to the patient? or I would say up to the patient. And I think uh, it's ones that are focused, that are patient focused that matter. To executives, it's a, it's a self-definition. Are you there to control the workforce so they do what you want them to do? Or are you there to serve the workforce so they can do what they know needs to be done? And the latter is, 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 is in my view, a much smarter way to manage. And uh, when you get when you get the shipments and you get the you get the jerks and they're there and they need to be out of the organization, get them out of the organization. This isn't a matter of conceding to whatever craziness is around, but trust the workforce. They want to do the right thing. I've got a couple more questions to uh, I think we've got your fan club um, uh, tuning into this. Uh, uh, Don, you'd be pleased to hear. So Rachel Rolf says, uh, love to hear from Don's uh, thoughts about patient-centered care. She loved your article, Confessions of an Extremist. <laughs> well, Rachel flatters me by having read it. I would say, read my article. I wrote The, the True Nature of Patient-Centered Care, Confessions of an Extremist. And as, I still believe it. That article is probably 15 years old or 20, Rachel. Thank you for citing it. It's, uh, it's what I said. It's the, um, the, the true nation of patients. The true, the true nature of patient-centered care is what I said earlier. It's Maureen Bisignano, my, my 
successor as IHI CEO and uh, Susan Edgman Levitan, a great scholar in this field and Mike Barry, they have been teaching for years this transition that you probably have heard about. Ch change the question. The question is not what's the matter with you. The question is what matters to you. And, and if we keep doing that, the power shifts in the way it should be, it should shift, which is we then, then we're saying to the family and the patient, um, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here to meet, meet your needs. Uh, that, that's, that's the right direction. That's what patient-centered care meet, means. There is fears. I mean, people, the clinicians say, oh, you know, patients don't know what they really need or they'll, their, their demands will be uh, unmeetable or, uh, and so on. I, uh, sometimes maybe, but most, most patients, most of the time, they're just as smart as you are and, 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 and they know more about their lives. So why wouldn't we ask them what matters? Well, we've got uh, another fan of yours, Jenny Vaughan. Um, she, I mentioned already the doctor's uh, association that she basically set up. Um, she says, uh, uh, the doctor's association came about from concerns about the convictions of doctors, uh, particularly David Sello, who I've already uh, mentioned, who were blamed uh, when largely the system was at fault. How do we convince the public that we can still be accountable, yet show that criminalizing or, or uh, I guess su suing doctors would have the same effect, really? Uh, criminalizing healthcare is so damaging, Jenny wants to know. Jenny is a, a particularly exceptional doctor, by the way, a neurologist at um, uh, that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, her question's right. I wish I had an answer. We saw it with a Dr. Bawagaba's uh, story as well. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the the it it is it, it it's the burdens on leaders. Uh, the, the leaders who understand the nature of quality, who who really believe that most people are trying hard to do the right thing most of the time, who understand the toxicity of blame. They will have to be consistent in their messaging. They have to over and over and over again say, you know. We're, we're trying really hard. We know uh, things go wrong and we're not going to, we're going to stop them going wrong. We're not going to stop it by putting heads on platters or people in jail or turning on the legal system. We're going to stop it by working together uh, to change the way we do our work and get smarter every day at it. Um, and when something really does, when it is a real act of, of uh, sabotage or, or a real miscreant, we'll, we'll deal with that quite promptly. But that's not the mainstay. It's very hard because the press is always there. The next, you know, tomorrow morning story will be about something that went terribly wrong and someone will be blamed, but it takes leaders to really say, you know, let's, let's just make this better together. Great. Well, I, I've got some great questions coming through. I don't have to think of any questions. I just read out the ones that our uh, listeners send in. Uh, we've got Natasha Robinson. She used to be president of our uh, patient set safety section at the Royal Society of Medicine and uh, uh, recently until recently she was a trustee lo lovely anesthetist from Oxford she says how can we engage patients in improving their own safety when they're receiving uh, health care that's an interesting idea um, how do we involve them in, in improving their own safety any thoughts on that it goes back to that confessions of an extremist article the, the answer is every way you can that that I, I've come to believe in my dotage that uh, the, the, the patients, families, the people we're trying to help belong in everything we do, in governance, in improvement projects, certainly in 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 shaping our services, in in and in the clinical encounter. The the best clinical encounter is one that might end with a clinician saying, "How did I just do? What do you think?" What could I have done better? That's the best clinical encounter. And so, and you, so at the micro level and the macro level, the patients and families, they need to be in the room. And the more, the better. It just, it, I've never seen a, people are always scared about it because they think that the patients will be somehow unwise. I, I just, I've never, I, I, I have yet to see that at all. In the Mid-Staffordshire case, I think anyone that was on that committee will say that the three patients with, I think it was two patients and one family member the other way around, they might have been the most valuable people we had in that room because whenever we went off track, they got us back on track. That's the answer. For individual, there's a piece of that question about individual care. How, if, if I'm getting care, can I make myself safe? And the, the answers I usually give right now is bring someone with you, 
you, you, you will need an assistant in the room. You're, you, you're, you're doing a lot of emotional work and you need someone there with you taking notes and asking questions too. And then the more you know, the safer you'll be. You know, what is the name of your medicine? What does it really do? What are the options the doctor is offering you? And, and um, that sense that of, of, if you have a question, it's a good question and you should ask it. And that, that's my counsel to individuals. Yeah, I, th I think the, we, we have certainly the way I was trained all those years ago was paternalism was was very much the uh, we were taught we were taught to hand out, you know, medicine just to the patient and they, they should just accept it. But, uh, you know, society's moved on. So we haven't got much time left, but, well, you know, I, at, the, at the moment, everybody's obsessed with politics. We're sort of horrified by it, but addicted to it. Um, can't can't take our eyes off. Uh, uh, these guys and you ventured into uh, politics when you stood for to be governor of Massachusetts I mean that is a whole different world isn't it that you were getting into yeah. there. tell us a little bit about that just very quickly yeah I, when I had run CMS I, I worked in government at a pretty high level and I saw the potential of good progressive government committed to people and 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 uh informed by science and knowledge uh and I and when I left I thought well I, you know, I'd like to keep on that piece. I think that uh, the chance to participate in government to me is a great privilege. I'd urge your participants to do that. Uh, the, the governorship in Massachusetts was open and I ran for the uh, nomination, the Democratic nomination for governor. I didn't win it. Uh, I did better than I expected, but uh, uh, than, than many expected, but um, it was a great privilege. 600 days of campaigning out in Massachusetts, 351 villages and towns. I visited 200 of them maybe and living rooms, libraries, debates, uh, people are good. I, I, I know that sounds so naive, but I was so moved, Roger, by the caring that people have for their communities. And um, all they, the, if, when you listen to them and you, and you, and you say, what do you, what, what, what do you want? What's your vision? And you go to, you go to that level, I'll tell you, it was, it was a, quite an experience uh, and I learned a lot. And I learned a lot about other policies, criminal justice, housing, transportation. And now as a physician, I understand healthcare doesn't create health. Communities create health. And uh, we need to focus on education and the experience of ch young children and the infrastructures in our communities and racism. That, that's, that's how we get healthy. And I learned that in that campaign. It was, it was great, it was a privilege. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, actually, one of uh, we've had 39 questions. I haven't possibly had time to give them all to you, but uh, one of our very devoted followers, Dr. Addy from Hull, says, thank you so much for your inspirational talk. So he's kind of done my job for me, Don. But I, I must say, I mean, I, I think your wisdom and your insight and just the way that uh, you, you've had this amazing impact on healthcare in the UK, in America, globally it is quite astonishing really so thank you so much for for your participation i do hope if you come over to london um, i'd love to have the chance to introduce you to to uh, the team at the rsm fantastic team uh, and at nice and uh, and uh, yeah it would be lovely to see you over here um, i can't so wait uh, can't wait for the opportunity roger i always love it there and i stay at domus medicus you know where to, you know where to find me <laughs> oh well absolutely right domus medicus in the rsm which is open again by the way it's a uh, and our restaurants open, even though uh, uh, it, it's COVID safe. So you do join us there. So Don, thank you so much. I've just got a, a few more uh, announcements to make because uh, the RSM has got a busy day tomorrow. We've got uh, Simon Wesley, our immediate past president, uh, uh, answering questions from all our COVID-19 series. Uh, that's at 12.30 tomorrow, so do tune into that. And then tomorrow evening, I've already mentioned, Jane McQuitty, wine correspondent of the Times, is having a more relaxed evening where we'll be sampling a few wines that she's specially selected. Next week's In Conversation is Baroness Julia Neuberger, very influential lady. Uh, we, we have diversity uh, in the RSM. We're not allowed to have too many men, too many white men. We've got to have uh, a diverse audience. So Julia is kindly joining us next week. And the week after that, we have Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, who is a pretty big name, and he's gonna be talking about some of his uh, musicals. And at the moment, of course, the uh, London theater has taken a massive hit because of this uh, virus. So uh, Andrew is doing a great job uh, in, in trying to protect London theater from the ravages 
uh, of the pandemic. So Don, back to you and thank you so much. Thank you audience for uh, tuning in and listening. Do remember that the RSM is somewhat under the cosh now because our building's closed. We're not able to host the conferences uh, that we normally do. So if you do feel generous and you want to keep the RSM going, we've been in, in existence for 215 years. Uh, it's my job to make sure that we stay in existence for another 215 years at least. Uh, and we do need uh, support to, to achieve that. So if you feel generous, please do uh, make a donation. So thanks again, Don. Um, Thank you, Roger. Love talking to you. Enjoy Martha's Vineyard. You showed me the picture of the blue ocean and the blue sky. Looks fantastic. So uh, uh, thanks so much for doing this for us. We really, really appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.